decided to drive. She'd worn me out. I was pretty much putty in her hands. Why don't we go to your place this time? I asked her as she started to drive. Her expression was pleasantly blank. It didn't so much as twitch at my question. Maybe next time. It's a little messy at the moment. How do you get around? You don't have a car, do you? I don't, she said, shrugging. Which is fine. It's not hard to get where you want in this town. Well, feel free to borrow one of mine. There are several in the garage. Take your pick. Her face became even more blank and only slightly less pleasant. I'm good, but thank you. I don't mind, really. It suddenly occurred to me that it would bring me immense relief if I knew she had safe transportation. How did she get around? And how could it possibly be safe for her to do so without a car? Don't worry about it. I am worried about it. Just pick a car and use it. It would make me feel better if you did. No, thank you. Why not? Because I'm not here to use you. I have a feeling you've had a bit too much of that in your life, dear. You wouldn't be using me. I'm offering. For me, because it would make me feel better to know you have a safe way to get around. She patted my knee and didn't say another word about it, no matter what I said. It was infuriating. She was as stubborn as she was sweet. Sweet and affectionate. Even as she drove, she kept reaching over to touch me. Sweet touches, stroking my cheek, rubbing my shoulder, patting my hand. I was still tired, still sleepy, but I sat there like a stone, hands on my knees while she did it. It feels nice to be touched, I mused. It was comforting, it occurred to me. And I was surprised by the thought. Chapter 8 I fell asleep the second I laid myself out on my bed and more than half expected to wake up alone. But I didn't, this time. I roused, wrapped around her, her little blonde head burrowed under my chin, one of her arms thrown over my ribs, her blunt nails tracing soft patterns onto my back. It was still light out, so it couldn't be that late. I was relieved. I wanted more of her, and not tomorrow. Today. Now. My hand stroked over her soft hair, and she shifted back to look at me, her gaze very alert, as though she hadn't slept at all. I took her face in both hands and started kissing. It was a slow, open-mouthed kiss, wet and warm and perfect. I would have been happy just to stay in bed and keep kissing her like that, but she went limp and started moaning, and I knew it wouldn't be enough for long. My hands started wandering. She was wearing a white T-shirt, one of mine, I thought, but I quickly discovered that she wore nothing underneath. She'd showered while I slept, I could tell. Her hair was dry, but she smelled like my soap. My inner mouth breather, the one that was just now coming forth, Loved that, relished that it marked her as mine. I pulled away from her soft mouth with a gasp, buried my face in her neck, and took the deepest breath. This thing between us, this insane energy that took me over when she came near, didn't seem to be fading the more I had her. It was the opposite. I really hoped she wasn't going to disappear from my life any time soon, but I was very aware that I had little to no control over that. She pulled away suddenly, shifted her body out from under mine, and moved away. I blinked, once, twice, trying to shift gears, attempting to keep up with whatever was going on, but my body was not cooperating. We need to eat, she told me, her face and voice unreadable. We skipped lunch and it's time for dinner. I'm starving. I nodded my head, still trying to resurface from my lust haze. I wasn't sure how she did it, but my brain was not functioning yet. Do you mind if I poke around in your kitchen to see what there is to eat? She asked, already moving off the bed. I was still throbbing, my eyes on her body, my mouth forming words that had almost no meaning to me. Make yourself at home. She strode from the room. My hand went to my cock and started stroking. I couldn't shift gears that fast, and I needed relief. 
It wasn't like I wasn't used to hand jobs, and I had some delicious visuals in my head just from the last ten minutes alone. Come keep me company, I heard her call from the hallway, and I stopped jerking with a curse. If there was even a small chance I could get off with her instead of just thinking of her, I had to take it. Who knew how long this little fling of ours would last? Certainly not me, and I needed to savor every luscious encounter. I slipped on a pair of gym shorts and that was it. I was hoping to need as little clothing as possible again in the very near future. She was already setting food out on the counter nearest the stovetop when I joined her in the kitchen. I leaned back against the island, folding my arms over my chest, and watched her. I'd found the one place in the oversized room to stand that would crowd her. She didn't complain. I hope you don't mind breakfast for dinner. I'm making French toast and bacon. I heard her. I just didn't really process her words, still watching her and throbbing in time to her every movement. I can't believe you have actual butter in your house. You even had a stick at room temperature and powdered sugar. Do you bake? The fact that she'd made the last bit a question was the only thing that had my mind catching up and my mouth answering, I don't know. The lady that does my grocery shopping and cleans the house likes to use my kitchen for baking when she's here. Wow, do you ever do something crazy and, like, eat a cookie? I laughed, but she was reaching up into the cupboards to grab something, and my t-shirt rode up high on her thighs, then her ass, and the laugh cut off short. Yes, sometimes I'll eat a cookie. I said it with a straight face, barely. Well, that's something. I won't press my luck and ask you how you feel about butter. I didn't answer or react. Not for a long time. I just watched as she cooked, and when she had laid out five pieces of egg-coated bread in a skillet on the range top, and was rinsing her hands while they sizzled and cooked, I moved in behind her, pressing the front of my body hard against the back of hers. I had to fight not to take her right there, right then. But something she'd said had stuck with me, and I was feeling adventurous. It freed something up inside of me to be with someone like her, someone that I knew wouldn't tell me no. I lifted her, wet hands and all, the second she turned off the water. I turned her around and perched her on the counter. I grabbed the butter, cinnamon, and powdered sugar lining them up near her hip and wrenched her t-shirt over her head without a word. She didn't protest, instead leaning back on her hands to watch me. She was utterly comfortable being nude, and I found that to be the biggest turn-on. Nothing seemed to disgust her or make her recoil. It was liberating to be with a woman like that. It was certainly nothing I'd experienced before. I dipped two fingers into the butter and smeared it onto one nipple, and then the other, then did it again, greasing her lavishly. So I take it you do like butter, she said breathlessly, with just the sweetest smirk. I smiled and spread a generous amount of cinnamon over the butter, rubbing it in, twisting and pinching her breasts in the process. Each hard peak was quivering before I was finished. Next came the powdered sugar. It got everywhere, but so had the cinnamon. I was positive that neither of us cared about the mess. Not one bit. I pushed her thighs wide apart and took the butter to her pussy, rubbing it over her lips, her little bush, her clit, even pushing inside. She squirmed as I covered her sex in the cinnamon, but swore it didn't sting. It only tickled, and by the moisture pooling there I could tell it was doing more. I patted an ample amount of powdered sugar on top for good measure. I was hungry. I stood back and enjoyed my handiwork, drooling at the sight of her naked body coated and spread for my pleasure. It wasn't long before I broke and set to work on licking her clean. I kneaded her breasts as I sucked at each nipple, lapping, nuzzling, licking. She arched her back and I could feel each restless shift of her hips as I sucked and sucked, drawing hard at each ripe tip. I pulled back to admire her body again. Each perky breast was pink from the attention, clean of cinnamon now. My eyes moved down to her cunt, which still needed my ministrations. I moved away, pushing my shorts off impatiently. 
She groaned out a protest, shifting restlessly, spreading her thighs even wider. She knew what was coming. I'd already spoiled her with how much I'd loved to eat her out, but she could wait a few more minutes and indulge me. I dipped my fingers back in the butter, spreading a small amount onto the tip of my cock. I went sparing on the cinnamon and sugar as well. For me, more than her, I couldn't have her sucking for too long, or I'd ruin all of my other plans. I leaned back against the edge of the counter, gripping the base of my cock hard. I didn't have to say a word. She hopped down, got on her knees, licked my tip once, twice, then started sucking hard. I pulled her back by the hair when I was getting too close, lifted her back up into position, then moving to bend down low, I buried my face between her thighs. The position wasn't exactly comfortable, but I barely felt it. I was thorough, seeking out every last bit of sweetness, making her come twice, two fingers shoved deep and moving hard as my mouth worked before I was done. She was clutching the back of my head, still crying out when I pulled back. I had to pry her fingers away to stand. I buried a hand in her hair and started kissing her, sucking at her mouth as my erection jabbed hard at her entrance. I broke loose of her lips just long enough to watch my hand guiding my cock home. I thrust roughly to the hilt and started fucking hard. She was so soft always, but even softer now after so much attention from my busy mouth. I gripped her hair, sucked her tongue, and palmed her breast as I jerked in and out, enjoying the feel so much that I held off on coming for as long as I could stand. It wasn't that long, but she didn't complain. God, I can't believe I'm bare inside of you, I gasped out, still twitching deep in her. Feels so good, but I can't believe I'm doing it. She clenched around me hard and milked another jerk of cum out of me. Me either. She gasped back. The French toast was burnt. No surprise there. She made new. I was famished and I ate two full plates of it. I swore up and down and meant it when I said it was the best meal of my life. Who could have guessed what an innocent statement about butter would do? I'd apparently recovered enough to turn that into a challenge. I had her giggling and spread out on the table, molested dish of butter in tow, before I quite knew what I planned. I climbed up and straddled her hips. I spread a generous amount of the creamy butter between her tits and started playing with them with both hands, handling them gently at first, and then rougher as her nipples peeked into hard crests. I still couldn't quite believe they were real, though they clearly were, but she was so tiny everywhere else and her tits overflowed my big hands. She started moaning and gasping out encouragement. She was, after all, the one that had given me the idea. I pushed the two ripe globes together, testing them, kneading firmly to be sure they could handle what I was planning. She didn't flinch, didn't wince, no, she keened and panted out her pleasure, and I took that to mean I could do what I wanted to her glorious chest. I swept a hand down, gathering extra moisture from her wet pussy. The butter was oily and more than enough, but I craved her wet heat. I rubbed it onto my cock, pumping at it until a few beads of pre-cum dribbled out. I moved up her body, grabbing handfuls of her ample breasts and pushing them together so they hugged my cock. Gripping hard, I started to thrust and thrust, fucking between her fleshy breasts in earnest, her delicate hands covering mine in encouragement. I titty-fucked her. This was something I'd only ever seen done in porn. My ex-wife, even if she'd been willing, didn't have enough going on up top to fuck like this. Iris had plenty up top, more than enough, and it was so soft and warm it was like I was fucking a cloud in my own wet dream. Her slender fingers cupped over my hands, one eventually slipping between us to cup at my scrotum, scratching lightly as I used her lush breasts hard. I lost my mind when I came fisting my cock and spurting semen all over her chest, up onto her chin, crawling up until my cock was jutting into her cheekbone, and I'd marked a good portion of her pretty face. I apologized profusely for it, swore I had no idea why I'd done that, 
even while I moved back down her body and ground my still twitching cock against her abused chest and finished thoroughly against that soft flesh. But she laughed it off, even while she couldn't open her eyes until I'd gotten her a clean, wet dish towel. It was one of those things I couldn't believe I'd done after the fact, and the doing of it had felt like a blur of absolute mindless pleasure. I washed her in the shower, couldn't stop stroking and kissing her and telling her how sweet she was, and of course apologizing several more times for coming all over her face. I'd never been like this before. Insatiable, smitten, and even sated beyond belief, I still found myself hardening enough to rub against her back. It was all for show. I was spent, but I still enjoyed the feel of her, the novelty of touching another human just for the contact. She moved against me, and it was like we were doing an obscene dance in the shower. I went with it, pushing her hands up on the tile. This lasted for a while before my perverted mind took it a step further. I spread her cheeks and pushed my cock into her ass, not with any real pressure. I was just feeling bold and wanted to gauge her reaction. She arched her back and let me do it. My mind went fuzzy because I could tell just from that brief contact that she was going to let me fuck her there. It wouldn't happen today, but that wasn't the point. The point was that this beautiful woman would let me take her every way I could think of, and I relished that. Loved it. Needed it. She made me feel so desirable when I'd felt so unwanted for so long. But back to my cock in her ass. I rubbed it there, soaked it up, and pushed it in while she braced herself and spread her legs wide. I bit her shoulder and worked in just my tip with excruciating care. Her entire body shuddered, and I bit harder, then pulled out and away. I soaped my hand again, cleaning us both, stroking myself curious if it was even possible for me to ejaculate again, but I stopped quickly. I needed to have a little more faith that there was more to come tomorrow, and at this rate I was going to work myself into a coma. She turned her head and shot me a questioning look. You don't have to stop, she said softly. I bent and kissed her shoulder. You are the sweetest girl, but I can't possibly go another round today. She just nodded and turned back to the wall, letting her head fall forward as the water ran over her. I got her off with my fingers, smiling into her neck as she gasped and shook in my arms. It was glorious. She was glorious. We got into bed naked and still slightly damp. I was wrapping myself around her when she said softly, It's time for me to go. I have to work a cigarette girl gig tonight. I squeezed her. Don't. Stay with me. She just shook her head. I can't. Not tonight. I can come back when I'm done, if you want me to. But it will be very late. That's fine. Come back whenever you can. She just nodded and went into my closet. I followed, even so tired and spent that I felt weak, because I didn't want her to slip away again while I was sleeping. That was a pattern I was very keen to break. Her duffel bag was in there, and she began digging through it. Oh, I forgot to tell you. While you were sleeping, the locksmith came by and changed your locks. He said you'd given him prior instruction, and that he could bill you later, so I didn't bother to wake you up. He left your new keys on the butler's pantry. Did he leave spares? Yes. I threw on some shorts. I need your cell number, I told her as I strode out of the closet on a hunt for keys. I don't have one. She called back. That stopped me short. You don't have a cell number? I asked dumbly. I don't have a cell. I was flabbergasted. Even I, the most reclusive person I knew, had a cell. She was in her twenties and obviously highly social. It made no sense at all. In fact, there were a lot of things about her that weren't adding up. I don't like them, she said, going back to digging through her bag. I don't like the idea that they act as a tracking device. What about a prepaid one? I don't think you even have to use your real name for those. Doesn't matter, I don't like them. I walked away, stewing about that. Was she in some kind of trouble with the law? Why was she so paranoid about being tracked? Who the hell didn't have a cell phone? I found the new keys, but left mine where they were, carrying the second setup to her. 
She took them without protest and an assurance that she'd be back later. I tried again to talk her into taking one of my cars, but she wouldn't hear of it. She was just as vehemently against me giving her a ride. It didn't help when I got a load of what she was wearing out. She disappeared into my bathroom for maybe fifteen minutes, blasting that drunk in the kitchen song on my bathroom radio, but came out looking like a million bucks, wearing more makeup than I'd ever seen on her, her hair smoothed out and loose down her back. But it was her outfit that really got me. Tiny black shorts and a tight, white halter necktop, and her shoes. God, I hadn't realized I was a shoe guy until I saw her sexy legs in strappy white gladiator-style heels that went up to her knees. They were killer, and I couldn't stand that she was going out alone like this, whatever the reason. I tried again to talk her into taking a car. I was agitated when she just walked out my front door, clearly on foot. I took my most nondescript car, a black Prius, less than five minutes later. The neighborhood guard knew what I was looking for before I asked. I just called her a cab, sir. She's waiting on the other side of the gate, he said quietly, pointing in that direction. I was pulling past the gate just in time to catch her getting into a taxi. At least she wasn't on foot, or, God forbid, hitchhiking. That had been my fear, the reason I'd followed her, to allay my fears. But even so, as though all impulse control had left me, I found myself following the cab as it pulled away. I wanted to see what she was doing, where she was going. She'd said something about being a cigarette girl, which, truth be told, I didn't like at all. I wanted to see what all that entailed, though I didn't intend for her to see me. The last thing I wanted to do was scare her off. It was the first time I'd ever tailed anybody, and I stayed far back as I followed the car across town to the strip. I almost lost them twice as I tried to stay inconspicuous, but with a little luck and a few red lights ran, I managed to catch sight of her exiting the vehicle at the entrance to one of the smaller casinos on the strip. I dropped my car off at the valet and entered the building in time to see her moving into the dense line of slot machines and then to the tables. I hung back when she sat down at a blackjack table and calmly handed in some cash for chips. I took up residence at a slot machine that blocked her from view and vice versa, except when I craned my head slightly to see her, which I did about once a minute, to be sure she didn't move. And she didn't. Not for hours. Two, at least, that I was sure of, because I sat there and watched her for that long. Men came and sat beside her, one after another, young and old, but they always left after a few rounds. She didn't seem to be turning on the charm for them. In fact, I never saw her head so much as turn in their direction, which did very good things for my very tight chest. And all the while, her stack of chips grew. By a lot. I didn't hang around long after two hours. I lost my nerve. I didn't want to be caught following her. I couldn't imagine she'd be coming back around if she realized I'd invaded her privacy like this. I was home for an hour and thirty-six minutes wide awake in my dark bedroom when she opened the door and slipped inside. I had a dozen questions for her, things I was dying to know about what she'd been doing and what she'd told me she was doing, but I managed to hold my tongue. So she had a gambling problem, and decent luck at the tables at least on this night. I thought to myself that I could afford a vice like that. At least she hadn't been out walking the streets or humping a stripper pole, as I'd had myself half convinced she would. She went into my closet quietly, only turning on the light of it after she'd shut the door. She was being thoughtful not to wake me. She was only in there for a minute before she turned off the light again and opened the door back up. I was lying on my side, stripped down to my boxers, and she slipped into bed on the empty side at my back. The minute her completely naked body made contact with my bare back, I gasped loudly, tensing. Shh, she uttered quietly, her soft hand sliding along my side to my abs and then down to my rigid cock. Then it was her turn to gasp, her soft touch switching to a hard grip. I turned and started kissing her. I pushed her onto her back, my hands running over her hungrily like I hadn't had her in days. Weeks. I fucked her, quick and rough, 
and drifted straight to sleep right on top of her, still buried to the hilt. I never did work up the nerve to ask her even one of my dozen questions. Chapter 9 Waking up the bright morning sun streaming over us, with her still wrapped in my arms, was an experience I'd not soon forget. And, as though my body had profoundly forgotten that I wasn't twenty, I found my spent cock stiffening between one contented breath and the next. Sometime in the night I'd rolled off her, or she'd pushed me off so I wasn't crushing her, and now I was on my back, her silky head with one soft cheek down on my chest, one thin arm curled over my side, her heavy breasts crushed, warm and delicious, against my ribs. If I had an ounce of self-control, I would have lain there and savored the moment. But I was chalk out of it, had used up my lifetime's worth before I met this gorgeous creature. So I had her on her back in a flash, sucking at her still soft nipples, my heart on jerking into the satin of her inner thigh, ready to take her, sleeping or not. When she still wasn't waking, but I was more than ready, I moved down her body and started eating her out like a man starved. That was when she woke, but not how I expected. She started and then gently pushed my head away. I loomed over her, using one elbow to balance, the other moving to her pussy, my eyes curious on her face. I had my hand bury two fingers deep in her when she pushed that away too. Her expression was still soft with sleep, but just a touch troubled. Could you just hold me? She asked in the most vulnerable tone I'd ever heard from her. I was putty, brought completely low with a few quiet words. I felt like a bastard, only thinking of one thing since the moment she'd approached me. What kind of a jerk didn't know just to hold a girl instead of going for a quick fuck when she was sleeping so softly, so trustingly against him? Me, apparently. Of course, I told her stiffly when what I wanted to portray was my utter repentance. I didn't only want to use her for that, though she couldn't have seen it that way. I lay rigidly on my back and pulled her over me, just how we'd been when she'd been sleeping so peacefully. One awkward arm went over her. Is this what she meant by holding? I was suddenly out of my depth. I was not quite sure how to be casually affectionate. I was not a demonstrative man, I considered how I'd gotten that way, how it had gotten to the point where a very beautiful woman just wanted me to hold her, to touch me and have me touch her, not necessarily sexually, but often, and how I had no clue what to do with that. My first and last instinct, unless we were talking about sex, was to keep my hands to myself. I thought of my childhood and how I could count on one hand the times I'd been hugged. My parents had been scholarly and wise and perhaps even good, but never anything approaching affectionate. And of course, I thought of my ex-wife and what she would have done if I'd just wanted to have her sit in my lap or, say, put my arm around her. The only picture that came up in my mind was one of her being annoyed. What was wrong with me that I'd stayed with a woman like that for so long? Why had that been so normal for me? For whatever reason, I'd just never had the option. The simple pleasure of keeping company with someone that enjoyed being touched and doing the touching. Iris snuggled into my chest, one of her velvet hands tracing gentle patterns on my collarbone, touching just to touch. I found that I quite enjoyed it, but also had a hard time adjusting to it or reciprocating. I patted her back, unsure what to do, what she wanted, or even what I wanted. My mind was still half on the sex that we weren't currently having, but the other half wanted to explore this other thing, this new intimacy, if I could only get past my own awkward self and figure out how. I put on sweats and a t-shirt, she put on boxers and a tight tank top without a bra, and we took our strange touching session into the kitchen, where she made us lunch. Somehow we'd managed to sleep in until almost noon. I couldn't remember a time I'd done that, even during one of my sleep-deprived deadline trances. She made us subs while I perched a hip against the counter and watched, not helping, too lost in my own musings, 
and just generally dazed at her presence. She kept me off kilter like that, moving to kiss me on the shoulder or nuzzling sweetly into my chest. I love this spot, right here, she murmured into my sternum, nestling her lovely face there, her lush, doting lips placing five quick kisses that moved up to my collarbone, as though it were the most natural thing in the world. Put a fork in me, I'm done, I thought, my mind feeling a bit mushy. I hugged her to me stiffly, wanting to do more, wishing I knew how to respond in a way that made her feel how she was making me feel, which was wonderful. She didn't seem to mind my inept response to her smooth affections. Thankfully, she was unfailingly patient with me, as though she knew why I hesitated. We ate together, and then she talked me into an afternoon of watching television. It worked out well, though it was the last thing I'd wanted to do, because it let me work past some of my touching restraints, when I felt she was adequately distracted. She was laughing at some god-awful reality show when she casually asked me to rub her neck. Affection with a purpose I could do, I found. It was a good way to break me in. I put my efforts into rubbing her neck and shoulders until she was a limp puddle on my aching lap. Finally, she pulled my hands away with a laugh, tugging them over her shoulders so she could slowly kiss each of my knuckles. You don't do anything half-assed, do you? She asked fondly. That I did not. She'd hit that one square on the head. I nuzzled my face into her hair and kissed my way to her temple. I was getting the hang of it, though, this affection dance. It was already starting to feel more natural. I've got to tell you, I'm kind of hoping this isn't really the only kind of show you like, I told her, hours into our marathon of horrible reality television. She turned and smiled at me. Of course it isn't, but I don't want to turn on anything too fascinating. I have to confess, I'm a bit of an attention whore, where you're concerned and I want your focus all on me. My eyes tried to bug out of my head. I don't know what show on the planet you think could distract me from you. I can't even wrap my mind around that idea. <laughs> she shrugged, wriggling deeper into my lap. Into my very obvious erection. So we're only watching this crap so I'll pay attention to you? I asked, feeling skeptical. She couldn't really think she needed a ploy like that to get my focus on her. Could she? I had her pegged as way more observant than that. It can't hurt. I bit her neck and fondled her. I'd show her focus. I'd reached my non-sexual touching breaking point. As though she knew it, without me even having to speak, she switched the music on, some sultry song with a heavy beat, with the female singer belting out some of the most obscene lyrics I'd ever heard. Did she just say he Monica Lewinsky'd all over her gown? I asked, feeling old and a touch slow. She giggled. Yes, and he didn't even bring a towel. That surprised a laugh out of me. But she shifted, arched her back, and it was cut off short. I kept her firmly on my lap, facing away, and peeled her tight shirt up over her breasts, her loose boxers down to her feet. I yanked my sweatpants to my knees and lifted her by the hips, my cock seeking her slick entrance. I pushed into her, my hands dragging her down by the hips until she let me in. The music played on while I took her like that, as leisurely as I could manage, stopping occasionally, seated to the hilt, to play with her soft, round breasts and suck at her silky nape. When I couldn't hold back anymore... My hands went to her hips and I started thrusting in earnest again, my eyes closing in pleasure, jaw clenching with every one of her needy moans. I gave full credit to all of my ejaculations the day before as I made her come again and again, stopping to fondle her for every one of her delicious orgasms, still hard and throbbing inside of her. My stamina, thank God, seemed to be well in hand again, at least for the moment. Oh, God, she moaned as she came down from another cock-clenching orgasm, her arms thrown up and back around my neck, pushing her lush breasts into my busy hands. That was amazing. You're amazing. I've never... Where did you... How did you manage to do it like this? 
I didn't have any kind of an answer for that, except to feel a glowing pleasure. I clasped her hips and bounced her some more on my abused cock, gritting my teeth to keep from coming. Above all else, I wanted to give her pleasure. The more the better. I was a writer, but I'd never been any good at romantic phrases, not on paper or in life. To make up for that, I wanted to make her feel with my body, the way she made me feel with her sweet, flattering words. Somewhere along the way, her boxers had been kicked off and she was spread wide, knees on the couch on either side of me. I was slouched, hips on the edge of the sofa for a better angle. I ran my hands along her outer thighs. It was more than a little impressive how she kept the pose, spread that wide on top of me. I grabbed her hips again and pumped into her hard. Once, twice, absorbing her cries of ecstasy with profound satisfaction. I rubbed at her ass, sliding my hands over her legs until I could massage her inner thighs. Am I stretching you too much like this? You're damn near doing splits. Her only response was to moan and shift on top of me, gyrating her hips, making my entire body clench in pleasure as her tight sheath worked me. I'd have sworn I was deep enough I must be touching her cervix. I jammed up hard and hit a wall so solid that she convulsed on top of me. Yeah, that was it. I did it again and again, but stopped when her cries began to sound alarmed. Am I hurting you? I asked, my hands shaking. I wouldn't be able to hold myself off for much longer. It's too much, she sobbed, but she was shifting against me. I feel too full. I started thrusting again, fucking her in absolute desperate earnest, but not going so deep, not grinding against that delicious part of her until the very end, when she fell apart again, and I let myself finally, mercifully come, jarring as deep as I could with a rough groan. Chapter 10 We turned off the cursed TV that was still blasting music videos and went to clean ourselves up. In new sweats and wet hair, she tugged me silently to my library, where she grabbed one of my books, which she dog-eared about a fourth of the way in. She curled up on my worn-in brown leather sofa and started reading. It was the first novel I'd ever written, and I wasn't sure I wanted her to read it, but she seemed to have already started in on it, so it was a bit late to stop her. She glanced up, saw my face, and smiled. It's really good. I was drawn in right away. I'm a hundred pages in, and I already feel like I'm submerged in this world you've created. I started wringing my hands, a nervous habit of mine that usually only presented itself before TV interviews. Thanks. That world has been a part of my life for many years now. Though I wrote that one so long ago, I'm not really sure I can recommend it as my best work. This was one of your first, right? The very first. She looked impressed, her pretty mouth moving into a little O. That's amazing. What a talent you have. I love the tone of the book, too. It's so gritty and dark, twisted, really, just perfect. I smiled wryly. That's sort of the genre. To be honest, I'd like to try something completely different, branch out a bit. She sat up, looking genuinely interested in what I was saying, which was not a reaction I was accustomed to from someone outside of the business. Oh yeah? Like what? I'd love to do a character piece, something emotional and raw and that never mentions a word about forensics or blood spatter. You should do it. I could. I'm only contracted for one book a year with my publisher at the moment, but I'd hate to sign on for more and be stuck in deadline mode even more frequently. Fuck em. Just write what you want and go indie. I had heard about this, was fascinated by it, actually. What have you heard about publishing independently? It's a thing. It's catching on, and I think you should try it. Quit signing your life away to those blood-sucking publishers. That was sort of my take on it, too. And what about you? Do you have anything you'd like to be doing different, career-wise or maybe educationally speaking? She grinned like I'd just said something very funny, and I realized I'd been wearing my pseudo-dad lecturing tone. It was ghastly, and I instantly apologized. 
She brushed it off, not offended in the least. I could never figure out just what I wanted to do. I still can't. I wish I could be like you with something I was so good at that I couldn't stop doing it. So you dropped out of school because you weren't sure which career path to follow. She smiled and tilted her head to the side. What are you fishing for here? You're a very smart girl. I'm just trying to figure out why you didn't take the college route. She shrugged. That's really the least interesting thing about me. I'm just done with school. Couldn't pay me to go back. At the moment, I want to learn from living. I found myself absently picking out a book, sitting next to her, sprawling out with my arm thrown over the back of the couch behind her shoulders. We both held books, but we didn't read. The rest of the day disappeared in a little puff of smoke without a regret as we started talking about the little things and the big, about the personal and the political. She had a mind and a motor, this one, and I found that it was just as attractive as the rest of her. Talking to her had the most bizarre, familiar feel to it, as though we'd done it a thousand times. It was all new every second with her, but it felt so right that it instantly found a place in my life, as though it was not something new at all, but rather a lost thing I'd found, like rereading an old book that I'd completely forgotten was my absolute favorite. Her eyes would widen and light up engagingly when she told a story, I found myself utterly charmed by them, by her. My fond gaze would dart from her eyes to her mouth and to her cute little nose when it scrunched up with her expressions. Her mouth may have drawn my eyes the most. Her lips were generous and lush, but as she spoke they moved around her words, flexible, thinning and thickening, ebbing and flowing. It was fascinating how it shaped around the things she said adding as much expression to her words as her gesturing hands. Her stubborn chin and jaw were another fascination, firming and flexing to illustrate a point. She'd do well on screen, I found myself thinking. As a newscaster, or even an actress, it was just so enjoyable to watch her. I didn't think I'd be the only one to think so. And it didn't escape my notice that even when she spoke in detail about herself, about who she was. She gave me absolutely no details as to her actual life, past or present. She'd speak of her nature, of her likes, dislikes, preferences, and weaknesses, but nothing about where she was from, nothing about her parents, her family, her schooling, her occupation. I tried to fish for more information about what she did for a living, but she only fed me that glib cigarette girl line. She didn't strike me as someone from her generation. She was mature, to say the least, and well-spoken, even well-read. She used words like nonsensical and dichotomy as she told a simple anecdote. That struck me as odd. To my mind, she seemed to know too much to be so young. More amazing than her ability to draw me in and engage me with her own talk was her ability to make me spill my guts to her. I found myself telling her every awful thing that had ever happened to me. Just the worst stuff that I hadn't shared in years because I normally hated to talk about it. Drudging it up never made me feel better, and I didn't figure anyone wanted to hear about it anyway. I told her about the guy that had bullied me to the point of terrorizing in high school. I'd been years younger than everyone else in my class, and it had made me the easiest mark. He was on a scholarship. He'd never have been in a school like that otherwise. It was a very expensive private school back east, and I found out later that his home life was pretty terrible, I told her. Part of me would always feel guilty for being born too smart and too privileged, and so I had to make excuses for my tormentor before I even began. An academic scholarship? She asked, the hand that wasn't holding my book in her lap tracing soft patterns on my forearm. I loved her relentless, affectionate gestures, but I sat them still, not touching her back. I wanted to, but it felt too forced, so I just sat and talked. Yes, he was very smart. Smart, devious, and violent are a bad combination. She bit her lip, her affectionate hand moving to clasp my cold one. 
What did he do to you? Just little things at first. He called it hazing because I was the youngest in the school by a lot. He'd pull down my pants in front of the class or dunk my head in the toilet, things like that. I didn't say anything, I guess, because I thought it was like a normal initiation. And I already felt like I didn't belong. I didn't want to be a baby about it. In fact, that was the absolute last thing I wanted to do. So I put up with it all without a word for quite some time. How long? she asked, looking completely absorbed in the story, her eyes eating up every part of my face, much like mine must have done to hers when she was speaking. My full first year. Like I said, it was mostly harmless at first. He kneed me in the balls a few times, which was awful, but that was the worst of it that year. She left my book resting between her legs and moved her other hand, rubbing mine with both of hers. My gaze was glued to that book as I continued. When we came back from summer break for the fall semester the next year, I could tell right away that things were going to be much worse. I found out later that his mother had died and his dad had been using him as a punching bag pretty regularly. I guess you could say that I became the target for his externalized pain. She grimaced, shifting closer. My eyes were still glued to my book between her legs, shifting against her boxer-covered crotch. I was familiar enough with what those boxers covered that I could picture how every part of her was making contact with that lucky paperback. She didn't even seem to notice it was there, still wholly focused on my face. The pranks became outright beatings. I started wearing a cup to school regularly because that was the worst of it, when he'd knee me or punch me in the groin. I was tall for my age, and though I was slender, I wasn't scrawny. But like I said, I was years behind. It was just impossible for me to defend myself, but no one else was going to do it. I took a deep breath, shocked that the story still troubled me, even after all these years. My parents noticed a few odd bruises, the occasional shiner, but I played it off saying I'd gotten them playing tennis or in gym class. I never once ratted him out, no matter what he did. I asked him once why he hated me. His response baffled me, but it didn't tell me anything. What was his response? She asked, voice quiet, eyes soft on my face. He just came back with, Does it matter? That was it. That's all he'd say, but if I had to guess, I'd say he hated me because he hated himself. He saw what life had handed him and what it had handed me, where I was going, and I became the literal punching bag for his rage at the unfairness of life. His hostility bothered me. It messed with my self-esteem for sure, but it's always been easy to bury myself in my studies, and so I did. I avoided conflict as much as I could and looked forward to the end of the year because he was graduating. It was an awful year. To this day, it was the worst time of my life, and that's including my divorce last year, which was hellish. He'd been laying off me during the last month of school, and so I figured he'd gotten bored tormenting me. Her hell was too excited about getting out of high school to care anymore. It was all unfortunate because I let my guard down. I just wasn't expecting him to come at me the way he did. I'd have been more careful, I guess. See, that's my low self-esteem talking. Even after all the things he did to me, I feel guilty about what happened. Her eyes were wide, as though she could read me well enough to know the worst part was coming. Well, to get to the point, he cornered me alone after Jim one day, beat me nearly unconscious, and then used my t-shirt to try to hang me by my neck from a locker door. No one else was around, and he left me like that. I had to stand on my tiptoes to keep from blacking out, but even then I couldn't get much air in my lungs. To this day, I don't know if it was an accident to rig me up that good, if he was trying to kill me, or if it was some miscalculation on his part. The only thing that saved me was the basketball coach just happening by. That's awful, Iris said, still rubbing my hand, sympathy in her eyes. I'd always assumed I was the type to hate pity, but coming from her it felt somehow gratifying. 
soothing even. I found that odd, to say the least. Yes, everyone thought so, especially the coach and the school's principal, and my parents, and the judge. He was a few weeks shy of eighteen and was charged as an adult for attempted murder. Ten years, no parole. If he thought his life was bad before, well, I suspect life showed him much worse after that. I hated him, but to this day I still feel sorry for him. What did I do to drive him to that? She made a tutting noise, but that was all. I felt very helpless back then, and it was about that time I started working out a lot, like I do now. I couldn't think of one time in my entire adulthood that I'd ever admitted aloud the true reason I felt the need to work out the way I did. Until Iris. I just wanted to be strong enough to defend myself. Well, you're certainly that. I've said it before, but you don't do anything half-assed, do you? That brought out a smile and lightened the mood. Working me, affecting me, soothing me, managing me, whatever you wanted to call it, she seemed to have a natural talent for it. As we talked, she openly admitted to being pragmatic about nearly everything. I should have been more troubled by this because she presented herself as a wild thing, and chaos and pragmatism weren't an easy alliance. Not without motive. I knew I should have been more worried about her motives. No. I wasn't an idiot, and the logical answer to Iris wanting me was pretty obvious. The thing was, I just didn't care. That, and I had the most naive, optimistic, completely ludicrous hope that she would come to feel something for me. Even if she had only approached me because she'd been able to spot me as some kind of a loaded mark. And frankly, bringing some joy into my life seemed worth a little money on my part. Because... Hell, I had money, and I could use some joy. It would sure as hell beat trading half my life's earnings for twenty years of misery, and the past year of humiliation I'd already experienced. That night, as we got ready for bed, she called out to me from the master bathroom. The door was slightly ajar, but I'd been giving her privacy. Alistair? She called again. I shuddered and felt myself getting hard. I loved it when she said my name. I'd just been standing there, staring at the door, but that got me moving. She was sitting at the vanity watching me in the mirror, still in her thin white tank top with no bra, and as I moved closer I couldn't fail to notice that she'd stripped down to just panties. Tiny, transparent panties. I was just about to grab her for obvious reasons when a few soft words out of her mouth stopped me. Will you brush my hair? she asked. It caught me off guard, but I agreed readily enough, taking the brush off the counter and setting to work, very tentative at first. I watched her face, hating the thought of drawing so much as a wince from her, but her expression was peaceful. Her eyes closed and her head fell back as I became more confident, raking the bristles firmly against her scalp, my other hand rubbing at her neck. It was nice. It felt more than a little unnatural, but nice. None of this was natural for me. Simple physical affection was a new development for me, and the fact that I enjoyed it was a revelation. It made me feel good. It made me feel contented, happy even. These were new things for me. Feeling good had never been a high priority for me, screwed up as that was. Perhaps I needed to change some of my priorities. Perhaps it was time to start enjoying my life instead of just working through it. And slowly, sweetly, Iris was teaching me something about that. I decided then and there that I wanted to let her. Her eyes opened and she looked at me. My mood changed between one blink and the next. I wanted her again. Needed her. It was madness. It felt as though my body had been switched into some kind of perverted survival mode where it wanted to fuck itself unconscious. It was a bit like blacking out when I got like this, as though something else overtook me. Her gaze stayed glued to mine as I slid the straps of her threadbare tank off her shoulders. 
Her clear-as-water eyes were changeable in the most fascinating way. They were like the sea, parts green and blue, shifting darker and lighter with the changing hours of the sun. Now, with the sun gone and the bright bathroom light flooding them, they were at their most mysterious, as though the day showed her truer than the night. I slipped the thin white material down to her nipples, rubbing it back and forth over each hard peak, teasing her into a gasp. She bit her lip, and I moved closer, pushing my erection into her shoulder as I fondled her roughly. Her hands covered mine as she squirmed in the chair. She was just so gloriously responsive to my touch. A few touches and she was ready, trembling for me. I couldn't seem to get over just how much I craved that addictive response. I moved around her, straddling her in the chair. I jerked my cock out, gripping her hair as I pushed the tip against her lips. They opened for me, her tongue sliding along my length as I worked my way to the back of her throat. I wanted her pussy, not her mouth, when I came, but I never got over the sight of her deep-throating me. Years without receiving oral would give anyone some sort of fixation, I thought. I dragged myself out of her mouth just shy of coming, pulling her up and moving behind her, facing the mirror. I took her like that, watching my hands fondling her as I took her slowly, standing up and braced against the bathroom sink. Her knees got too weak to hold her up, and I took her to bed, pushing her face down and pulling her hips up as my pace quickened, and I rutted in her earnestly now. She started gripping me harder with her release, and it sent me over. I didn't know what I wanted. I wanted everything because I pulled out still twitching to come on her ass cheeks, moving up to thrust my twitching cock into that little groove at the bottom of her spine. I made a huge mess, and neither of us cared. I fell asleep, still on her back, but I was pretty sure she passed out first. Chapter 11 We developed a pattern, if you could call it that, over the next few weeks. Sometimes she'd stay over, and sometimes not. But we spent a lot of time together. Enough time that I barely got any work done. I tried to work several times. I went into my office, put on my thick black editing glasses, and even opened up the writing program on my computer. If she wasn't around, I'd just sit there, in a daze, my mind full of her, where she was right then, the things we'd done, the things I wanted to do when I saw her again, where she lived, why she lied, why I let her and never say a word. If she were around, she'd inevitably end up knocking on my office door. I'd tell her to come in, because who wouldn't? She'd pop her gorgeous blonde head in and smile. She'd tell me how handsome I looked in my glasses, or ask me if I wanted her to make lunch. Once, she just came and straddled me where I sat, smiling into my face and told me how my eyes made her melt. That got to me. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. My eyes? I asked her, blinking slowly, pulling my glasses off to set them on my desk. She nodded, using her fingertips to rub against the scruff on my jaw in a way that had it going slack. Yes. Sometimes they're so brown, and sometimes I think they're more hazel, but they're always, always so warm. They're by far your most dangerous weapon, Dare. When I first met you, I'd have sworn it was your body, but no, I changed my mind. It's your eyes. I just kept staring at her. I had no words. I knew I should be saying something sweet back to her, and I felt it and wanted to say the right thing. But I just had no inkling what it was. Something was happening inside of me, something directly related to the way this girl was making me feel. Something in the way she was helping me to change. But I had no appropriate words for it yet. Not even one. I had lots of the wrong ones, though, so I said those. You're silly, I told her, and immediately wanted to take it back. Luckily, she didn't take offense, in fact, laughed instead. Yes, I am, and that I definitely blame on your body. She was so much better than I was at finding appropriate words. Those ones made my day. 
I tried hard to return the favor and make hers with my tongue. The sex with Iris was amazing. Out of this world, it never slowed down, not for one day of those short weeks. But nearly every night she went out by herself. And often more and more, actually, I followed her. It was always to a different place, but for the exact same thing. I was 100% sure she had a gambling problem, but at the moment it seemed to be making her money. I wasn't sure what to do about it. Sometimes I had myself convinced that this thing between us was real, that we had some profound connection that actually reached across age boundaries, that I was smitten enough and she was mature enough to make this work into something permanent. I couldn't analyze that thought process for long, though. It didn't hold up against my logical brain's theory that every sad, lonely man who had found themselves in this position had told themselves the exact same thing. There was a reason we did this. Because it felt infinitely better than the truth. And the fact that she still slipped away, lying to me about her whereabouts, nearly every night was hardly comforting. As long as I ignored all the little lies which I told myself firmly they were, Things between us were going very smoothly. Until every insecurity I had about her seemed to come to a head one morning, a few weeks later. It all started with one simple word, and the fact that I had such a hard time saying it to her. That word was no, and I had never successfully used it on her before. She'd stayed the night again, an incredible night, where she hadn't even gone out by herself but instead stayed in and had dinner with me, followed by lots of something even better. My mind was stuck firmly on that something better as I showered, Iris still tucked away in my bed, sleeping peacefully. I'd have loved to be there with her. In fact, I'd overslept. I'd been enjoying my own peaceful sleep so much. The problem was I had company coming, company that I didn't want her to meet, and vice versa. It was just awkward. I'd been booked to do a magazine interview months prior, one that featured photographs of me taken around my house. The interview would happen about a week after the photos were taken, which was scheduled for this unfortunate day. I'd recommended the photographer they were using myself, as she was a local contact and somewhat of a friend. Well, it was more complicated than that. The photographer happened to be a very beautiful 41-year-old woman that I'd been planning to ask out just as soon as I got over my general bad attitude towards getting back in the dating pool. We'd worked together a few months ago on my headshot, and we'd sort of hit it off. We'd bonded over the fact that we both just escaped from bad marriages. This photographer, Lourdes, and I had done a bit of flirting, and it had been my impression that she might not be averse to dating me. I had no intention of asking Lourdes out now, not after everything that had happened, but I still couldn't stand to see her reaction to finding a girl like Iris ensconced in my house. She'd think I was a creep, and rightfully so. I was determined to avoid that. But how, well, that was beyond me. It wasn't like I could kick Iris out or even ask her to leave for a few hours. What would I say? What excuse could I make? I finished showering and got dressed in a foul mood. I put on a deep navy suit with a dark gray dress shirt and a navy bow tie. I always felt a little smothered in suits, but I rarely had to wear them, so I couldn't complain. This one had been picked out for me, every piece of it, and sent to me by the magazine doing the interview piece, so I couldn't even grumble about that. She was stirring on the bed as I approached it. I, um... Uh, have a thing today, I said awkwardly, completely lost on what to tell her. I had no idea how to navigate this. Above all else, I didn't want her to think I was kicking her out of my house, even though I basically needed to, and fast. She blinked sleepy eyes at me, sitting up, the sheet wrapped around her naked body. She took in my attire with a close, narrow-eyed perusal. Okay, I'll grab my things and get out of your hair she finally said. In terms of things she could say, that seemed at the top of the list of ones that worked in my favor. 
Still, I felt like shit, and apparently I wasn't in any mood to work in my own favor. She hadn't even asked for an explanation, but for some reason I felt like I needed to give her one. I'm dressed like this because there's a photographer coming over to take pictures for a magazine interview I'm doing next week. Her brows shot up and she smiled. That's amazing! She dropped the sheet, got out of bed, and moved into the closet completely nude and comfortable with it. I kept my distance. I didn't even own the suit I was wearing and I could see us getting it very dirty in a hurry. If I were smart, I'd have taken her quickly before I showered, at least tried to get her out of my system for the time she'd be gone. I made my way into the doorway of the closet after one long minute of debating what to do. She was still naked and digging through her big yellow purse, and then the small suitcase she'd taken to bring in with her overnight. No matter how I nagged, she still kept everything packed. She wouldn't even hang up her nicer clothes. It was infuriating, but one thing I'd learned fast about Iris, she never gave in unless she wanted to. I didn't see what she pulled out of her bags, too focused on her bare skin as she moved around on the floor. It would be so easy to take her like that, just a button and a zipper away. If I was very careful, I could keep my borrowed suit pristine, I told myself. I adjusted myself, moving my errant erection carefully away from the front zipper of my slacks, intending to carefully set it loose from its suddenly tight confines. I squeezed my tip hard in an effort to get myself under control. Iris straightened suddenly and caught sight of my dilemma. She grinned wickedly. Should I be hurrying? What time will the photographer be over? Do you even have time for any of that? She waved a hand at my crotch. I shook my head, saying, Maybe. She laughed. What does that mean? I'd gotten myself dressed before I'd woken her for just this reason. I really didn't have time. I'd used all of it up sleeping in too late. She'll be here in half an hour. She was studying my face with probing eyes, her expression closing off. And I need to be gone by then? She asked very slowly. I nodded, jaw clenched, hating the way she was looking at me. Well, then we really don't have time. I'll just need a minute. She moved into the bathroom. I counted to one hundred, watching the slightly ajar door. She turned some music on, something on the old little iPod she carried around, I thought, since I recognized the song. It was one of the songs she played on repeat all the time, the one about the drunk chick waking up in the kitchen. She must have hooked it up to the small speaker in there because it was blasting. She was going to leave without another question, just like I needed her to. But it didn't feel right. Chapter 12 I went into the bathroom and instantly regretted slash loved it when I found her putting on makeup standing up. Wearing nothing but a neon orange thong and those damned white gladiator sandals of hers, her body moving slightly to the beat even while applying her mascara. I pulled up a chair watching her. I knew she'd get ready and go quickly. She never took long to go from looking naturally beautiful to utterly polished. She'd be out of here in ten minutes, tops. I couldn't stand it. I sat and sulked, hands on my knees, stewing until I was close to boiling over. Why are you wearing those shoes at eleven in the morning? I said loudly to be heard over the music. And why so much makeup? Where are you planning to go? She took that little mascara brush thingy away from her lashes and met my gaze squarely in the mirror. I looked away. I'd answer you, but unless I'm mistaken, you want me out of here before your photographer shows up. You don't want her to see me, right? I swallowed, feeling thoroughly ashamed of myself. She'd grasped the situation right away and too clearly. I felt like a scumbag. It wasn't that I was ashamed of her, not her. Someone her age, though, yes, I was ashamed of that. It's not you, I began. It's not you, it's me. Is that what you were going to say? 
Are you asking me to leave here for good? I felt the moment when I broke out in a hard sweat. My hands gripped hard into my knees. No, please don't do that. I'm not saying that at all. I was going to say that it's not you I don't want her to see. What is it then? Why do I get the feeling that you want me out of here bad, like I'm on some kind of a timer to get out of your house? I shook my head over and over, trying to fish for a lie. I'd always been a terrible liar. It's not you. It's your age. I knew right away that I shouldn't have said it. The whole thing had gotten away from me, and I knew after that statement there was no going back. You don't want her to see my age, she asked tonelessly, applying gloss to her lips. Want to tell me exactly what that means? I'm too old for you. You're way too young for me. The photographer is a friend, and she's going to think I'm a complete creep if she gets a load of you. She twisted her lip gloss shut slowly, then set it down very abruptly, turning to look at me. I tried hard to keep my eyes on her face, but she was topless, and I only half succeeded. She leaned a hip on the counter, hands on her hips, utterly unconcerned with her lack of clothing. What about me makes you look like a creep? I shook my head, determined that I wouldn't give her more of an answer than that. I was only digging a deeper hole with every word, even my socially awkward self could see it. She walked to me, but slowly, one of her favorite songs playing loud in the background, her hips swaying to the beat. I kept my hands determinedly on my knees as she moved between my legs, one of her hands reaching up to grip my hair. Tell me, Dare, what is it about me that makes you look like a creep? She said it quietly, tipping my head back while she leaned forward, her heavy tits dangerously close to brushing my jaw. Because there's only one reason people our ages get together. And what reason is that? Her voice was so quiet I nearly didn't catch her words. I shut my eyes. To use each other. That's the only reason, huh? I suppose I can guess how you would use me. My body is the only thing you could possibly be interested in, I presume? Is that how it is? I winced and shook my head. That's not how it is. What I meant is that's how it will look. I felt her moving against me and couldn't help myself from opening my eyes and glancing at her. I moved my hands from my knees to the sides of my chair as she swung one long leg over my knee, straddling it loosely. She started to dance, gyrating against me, naked breasts shoved into my face until I panted. She swung her leg until she was standing back between mine. She twisted a face away from me. Her head went down, her ass up and shaking. The song played on, the singer's words making me blink and wondering if I'd heard correctly, but I didn't ask about it, and the singer went on to sing about getting called peaches when she got this nasty. As though that damned song wasn't enough to make me feel like an old fart, I was pretty sure Iris was twerking at me. It was as though the very mention of our age differences made her want to throw it in my face. She was young. I was old. She was wild. I was tame. What on earth were we doing here? How the hell would we ever fit into each other's lives? The answer was simple and bleak. We didn't, and we wouldn't. You worry way too much about how things will look, she said turning back around to move her breasts against my face. I gripped my chair and tried hard not to start licking anything. We did not have time for any of this. I needed to tell her to stop. I needed to do the impossible and tell her no. We're running late, I said stiffly, not quite holding back a half-nuzzle into her cleavage. It was abysmal, but the best I could manage in terms of turning her away. She straddled me, still standing her hands, sliding up her body to push her breasts up and together into my face. I was doing good right until one of her pert little nipples rubbed against my lips. I groaned, shifting restlessly, 
hands keeping their death grip on the sides of my chair. She pulled slightly away and I groaned again. One of her legs went up and over my shoulder, her knee perched there, calf draped behind. Her hand in my hair guided me forward until my face was buried in her lower belly, then slightly lower. She started moving, some obscene dance that had my face inching lower, then away, then lower, until I was biting at her thong to keep her from moving away from my face. In my defense, I did keep my hands to myself. My tongue now, that was another story. I started licking, my tongue lashing out against her skin every time she brought it close, lower every time until I was thrusting it against her clit with her movements. Her breath grew ragged, but she pulled away nearly as soon as it did. She went to lean against the counter again, not bothering to fix her panties which I'd tugged down past her pussy with my teeth. My hands were on my fly, carefully trying to free my pulsating cock when she spoke. Your doorbell just rang. Twice. I cursed fluently. I stood, dragging a hand through my hair. I'll go get it while you get dressed. She shrugged, drawing my eyes back to her chest. Sure. Listen, I'll introduce you to the photographer on your way out. She shrugged again. But something in her eyes was getting to me. It doesn't matter. I was being a jerk. I'm sorry. You don't need to leave. You should stay. No, that's okay. I need to go. I have plans. She shot me a smile that was all teeth. I didn't like it. What are your plans? Why, I'm planning on doing what twenty-year-olds do, Dare. I'm going to go be impulsive. Hell, tonight I'll even go to a rave. I didn't know what part of her statement to take more exception to. Wait, yes, I did. Twenty-four, you mean, I said, jaw clenched so hard my teeth ached. She rolled her eyes, fully adopting this new, harder persona of hers. I didn't like it, not one bit. Oh, yeah, I'm twenty-four, right? Same diff to a forty-year-old, I'm sure. No, no, not at all. Twenty is not at all the same as twenty-four, even to an old guy like me. And what the fuck do you mean you're going to a rave? Was that a serious statement or some kind of joke? Don't worry about it. It's a too young thing. You wouldn't understand. Do they still have raves? Do they still call them raves? I was getting more agitated by the second. I really couldn't tell if she was just messing with me, and I couldn't stand the thought of her going to some sort of a drug party. They do. And does it matter what they call them? I was just trying to use a reference that someone your age might understand. So you want me to know that you're going to some kind of a party where you'll, like, suck on a pacifier and do ecstasy? No pacifier. This one will be more about neon body paint and some Skrillex. And drugs, I added, fists clenched. I really couldn't let her leave like this, and I had no idea how to stop her. She shrugged. I don't know. Aren't drugs a part of being too young? Don't do this. Don't act like this. You know I'll worry if you leave now. The doorbell rang again, and we still just stared at each other. She turned off her music, then looked at me, arms folded across her chest. Go get that, she mouthed at me. I went to answer it, feeling too agitated to deal even with the lovely, pleasant Lourdes. I opened the door and tried to smile. Lourdes smiled back, but it faltered as she studied me. She was a sleek, beautiful woman with big, dark eyes and masses of wavy black hair. Is this a bad time? I shook my head, then stood back and waved her in. Can I get you a drink? I asked, glancing at the stairs, wondering what Iris was going to do, how she was going to act if she was going to leave. I found that I didn't care now what else she did, as long as she didn't leave. Lourdes could draw her own conclusions and think whatever she wanted about me. I couldn't let Iris leave like this. No, thank you, said Lourdes. Let me go play around in your backyard. I'd like to see how the light is going to work out there at this time of day. Actually, you should come with me. I followed her out.
leaving the back door open and trying to keep the bottom of the stairs in sight so Iris couldn't slip away without me knowing. That didn't last long. Lourdes called my name. I turned to look, and a few minutes passed while she set up. Excuse me, I said when I couldn't stand another minute, striding back to the house. I heard the front door shutting as I stepped inside and I broke into a sprint. I caught her in the courtyard, both of her bags in tow. She shot me one look and I started shaking my head. Don't, I told her, having to clench my fists to keep from grabbing the bags out of her hands, to keep from forcing her bodily back into the house. I had no right to stop her. Why are you taking all your things? She shook her head, not quite looking at me. It's not a big deal. Listen, I'll give you a call later. I took a step closer and she moved farther down the drive. I followed. You don't have a phone. I'll find one to borrow. You don't know my number. So tell it to me. I rambled it off, followed by, You need to write it down. No, I don't. Forget the call. Just come back inside. Stop, she said faintly, still moving away, still taking all of her things with her. Will you just come back tonight, please? We were nearly to the end of the drive, then we were past it. She didn't stop, rolling her suitcase into the road, still wearing those ridiculous heels. When I tell you I need space right now, you're going to want to listen to me, she said, her tone brooking no argument. I'll give you a call later. She turned her back on me and began to walk more briskly, clearly in a hurry to get away. Chapter 13 It took me all of five seconds to decide that I needed to follow her. Lourdes was in the entryway, looking concerned when I strode back inside. I think we should do this later, she said before I could so much as make up an excuse. I couldn't tell this is a bad time. It is, sorry, something unexpected came up. She waved that off. No worries, we'll reschedule when you have time. I agreed and didn't even see her out. I had no time to waste. I turned out of the neighborhood, driving my black Prius just as she got into a cab. I followed. I was getting better at it, though it was odd to try it in the full light of day. I kept wanting to duck, but I could see the back of her blonde head, and it never turned around, staying downturned the entire drive. The taxi led me to one of the worst neighborhoods in town. It was close to UNLV. I could recall reading something years ago where they'd made the housing around the university cheaper but hadn't limited eligibility for it to students, the end result being students living two doors down from drug dealers, frat houses next to illegal cat houses, and other fun scenarios. It made for an interesting off-campus life for the students, but I supposed it was all par for the course at the School of Broken Dreams. I idled at the curb a few houses away and watched her get out of the taxi. This was really the worst-case scenario. When I was fretting about where she lived, which I had plenty, this was just what I worried about. She entered the downstairs unit of a tiny duplex parked between what had to be a large frat house and just from the general condition of it and the people loitering in the yard, what I would have bet money was a crack house. I felt helpless. I couldn't stand the thought of her being in a place this unsafe, though she clearly lived here. I couldn't even call her, and as much as I wanted to follow her to her front door, she'd been very clear about needing her space. I also couldn't shake the look she'd given me before she left. My mind had been stuck on that look, obsessed with deciphering it for the entire drive over. It hadn't been anger or even strictly hurt, though there had been some of that mixed in. It took me a while, but I did place it. She'd been disappointed in me, as though she'd expected better from me than how I'd acted. I didn't like myself very much just then. Finally, I made myself leave, but it was far from easy, and the last thing I wanted to do. It was a hellish day of waiting and worrying. I tried to work, but it was no good. 
I tried to watch TV and even found myself watching some bad reality shows that seemed right up her alley, but I didn't stay distracted for long. I went grocery shopping, then came home and made an elaborate dinner for myself. I made enough for Iris, still holding out hope that she'd just show up. She didn't. I went to bed at eight and then tossed and turned for hours. I must have fallen into a fitful sleep because my phone woke me up when it started ringing at around 3 a.m. Hello? I mumbled, mind still waking. Dare? Iris spoke into my ear, her tone so different, so wrong, that my whole body tightened up with that one word. Iris, where are you? I asked. I was on my back, phone to my ear. I could see my chest expanding with a deep breath at the bottom of my vision as I waited for her to answer. I'm at a party. I don't feel well there, and I, I need a ride. I sat up. I'll be there right away. Do you have a street number or some directions to where you are? I moved to my closet and pulled on a pair of sweatpants one-handed while she named off an address. Okay, honey, I'm on my way. Wait, she said, still sounding wrong. Stay on the phone with me. Talk to me. I need to stay awake. I was already in my car, typing the address into my GPS system. What's going on? You don't sound like yourself. I had a drink, and it's not agreeing with me. What kind of a drink? A cocktail. I don't know what was in it. It was orange, and I think somebody slipped something into it. I felt my rare temper starting to boil up. Can you go out front and wait for me? Will that be safer for you or worse? I couldn't hear much on her end but loud background noise for a while, and I was more than a little concerned that she'd passed out, but finally, mercifully, she responded. I'm out front. Are you close? I'm really out of it. Dare, I can't think straight. It scares me. I cursed and sped up. I am five minutes away. Just hold on. I've got you. I'll take care of you, honey. The location was a large warehouse on the darkened street across the freeway from the strip. The place was packed, neon paint-covered partygoers loitering outside and walking in the street to the point that I had to honk at several stoned kids just to park on the curb out front. Even with all of the young painted punks around, though, I had no trouble finding her. She would always stand out. She was wearing some tiny white shorts and a white string bikini top, or at least, I thought they'd started out white. She was covered head to toe in all sorts of neon, some of powder, some of paint. Even her hair, pulled up into a high ponytail, was more pink than blonde at the moment. She was standing, swaying on her feet as though she was afraid to sit down. I rushed up to her, pulling her against me but even then she barely seemed to see me, truly out of it. Let's go home, honey, I told her, taking her large bag off her shoulder, putting it on mine, guiding her to my car with an arm around her waist. My voice or my movements seemed to take her out of her daze a bit. She pushed her body into the front of mine, her arms going around my neck, breasts rubbing into my chest. Even at that contact, I wasn't turned on. I was too worried to get hard. I didn't like the state I'd found her in. You came for me. Thank you. I just grunted and started herding her to the car again. She went easily enough. I'd driven my dark gray TT because it was fast and easy to maneuver. The car was barely used and she was getting neon paint all over the passenger seat. I didn't give it a second thought. Couldn't have cared less. The only thing I cared about just then was getting her home safely. She didn't pass out right away, shifting restlessly as I started to drive, reclining her seat. In a gesture of pure affectionate comfort, one that she had taught me, I put my hand on her knee and squeezed. She took it completely the wrong way, parting her legs and pushing my hand up into the pant of her tiny shorts, rubbing my knuckles against her pussy. Surprised, I jerked my hand away, sending her a shocked look. She gave me a doped-up looking smile, reaching up to untie her bikini. She was topless in a flash, fondling herself with one hand and pulling my fingers back to her pussy with the other. 
I pulled away again gently, looking back at the road. She was nearly naked, her luscious body covered in some intriguing paint, and I wasn't even tempted. She was just too out of it. God only knew what had been slipped into her drink. You're not yourself, I told her. We need to get you home, get some food and water in you, and let you sleep this off. She made a noise, a sort of sigh, and I glanced at her. She smiled at me. See, that's why I need you. You're the only one looking out for me. You'd be sad if something happened to me, wouldn't you, baby? Her eyes were drifting closed. I didn't think she expected an answer, but I gave her one anyway. Yes, you sweet girl, I'd be very, very sad. She didn't say another word. By the time I made it home, she had passed out cold. I carried her inside and up to my bed, and she didn't so much as twitch. I was worried, really worried. I thought about calling an ambulance because I couldn't rouse her, and she seemed to me to be barely breathing, but I honestly didn't know if that was an overreaction. Finally, I decided to call a neighbor, two estates down, that I knew to be a doctor. I would owe him huge after this because he came right over, not five minutes after I'd called, physician's bag in hand. John was a small man in his sixties with glasses and a kind face. I'd always liked him, though we didn't see each other much. I led him up to my bedroom, telling him in detail about her condition. You think she was drugged? It sounds like it. She said she had a drink and she was really out of it when I picked her up. I'd pulled a sheet up to her neck and my fists clenched when one of the first things he did upon sitting down on the bed was to pull it down far enough to listen to her heart rate with his stethoscope. What is she covered in? He asked, sounding more curious than judgmental. I flushed. Some sort of body paint. At the party she was at, everyone was wearing it. He examined her briefly and asked me a few more questions. Should I call an ambulance? Does she need to go to a hospital? His brows drew together as he stood. At this time, I'd say no. Whatever she was given seems to be mild. She likely didn't consume an entire dose. Until she gets worse, I'd say the remedy here is to let her rest. Call me if anything changes. I walked him to the door. Before he made to leave, he gave me a probing look. Is she your girlfriend? Sort of, I said with a wince. I knew everything he must be thinking. Well, you look out for yourself, Alistair. You're a good person, a trusting person, but not everyone has good intentions. I smiled tightly. He thought I was an idiot and a sucker. I couldn't blame him. Thanks for your help, John. Anytime. Call me if anything changes. She will likely sleep for quite some time and wake up feeling awful, but anything besides that, you call me. I will. I owe you one. He smiled. You do. Hurry up on that next book for me. I've been looking forward to it for months. I tried to make my smile more convincing. I'll get my hands on an advanced copy for you, I swear. Now we're talking. That'll make us even right there. We exchanged a few more pleasantries and then he left. I went upstairs to check on Iris. She slept on. I stripped what little clothes she had on, trying to make her comfortable. I got a wet cloth from the bathroom and cleaned most of the paint and powder off, then tucked her in again. The sun was starting to come up when I finally fell back to sleep. I woke up after eight hours with a splitting headache, Iris still unconscious beside me. I checked her breathing and her heart rate, and she didn't stir. She slept on for five more hours. I was a mess by the time she finally woke. I was angry and anxious, worried and agitated. She was still blinking, struggling to sit up when I started in on her. What were you doing? What were you thinking? She still looked more than a little out of it, which wasn't helping my temper. You aren't ever allowed to pull any shit like that again. Why would you go to a place like that? Why would you put yourself in that position? I glanced at her, and the dazed look was leaving her, being replaced by an expression I didn't like any better. 
No, in fact, I liked it less. We need some rules here, some structure. What happened last night, that was unacceptable. You aren't allowed to do things like that, to put yourself in danger like that. She sat up, pushed the covers off, and swung her legs off the side of the bed and onto the floor, her eyes on me the entire time, her gaze turned, insolent. I'm not allowed, huh? She was completely nude, parts of her still covered in bits of bright paint, her hair still mostly pink, loose and disheveled now. Aside from her voluptuous curves, she looked ridiculously young like that, and it wasn't helping. In fact, it was the whole fucking problem. No, no, you're not, I said my voice hard. Big talk from a guy that told me yesterday that we were just using each other. Remember that? I took an involuntary step back at her tone. I told you. I know what you told me, and I know what you think. You think that people our ages can only use each other, which tells me a lot about what all of this has been for you. I shook my head, but I didn't know what to say. What could I say? In a way, I had been using her. Not just for her body, but for the way she made me feel. There was more to it than that. Sure, but I'd taken everything she'd offered, everything I wanted with my eyes wide open, fully prepared to give back anything she might want from me. The big question was, what did she want? She'd never even come close to showing her hand, and so I'd let logic draw the conclusion for me. Let's just drop it, I said evenly, trying to calm her, trying to calm myself. You need a solid meal and... Quit telling me what I need, and forget about telling me what I'm allowed. As she spoke, she was striding into my bathroom, slamming the door behind her. I went down to the kitchen and started making her breakfast. She needed to eat, and I needed to take a moment to get a handle on my temper. I thought I'd done a decent job by the time she joined me in the kitchen, wearing a tiny white slip of a dress that must have been stashed in her purse. She had no underwear on with it that I could tell. Her hair was still wet, her face clean and lovely and free of any makeup. She was so beautiful, just stunning. The sight of her made me immediately want to soothe things over and not just so we could fuck again. I turned off the burner, dishing out the food as I spoke. This has all gotten blown way out of proportion. Do you still think I'm too young for you? She interrupted. Do you still think you're too old to do anything but use me? I turned to face her, folding my arms across my chest. I shouldn't have answered, but I did. You are definitely too young for me. And just what do you imagine my too young self wants from you, Dare? I want you to spell it out for me. What do you think this is? Chapter 14 I really didn't want to answer that question, but her derisive tone was getting to me and my temper still boiled just under the surface. I waved my arm around, indicating the house. Since I'm not an idiot, I'll go ahead and pick the most obvious answer here. I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have followed me home if I was broke. You saw a rich guy at the gym who wanted you and you decided to rock his world. So I just, what, decided you looked wealthy and went after you for no other reason than that? I can only assume. What else could it have been? How did I know you were rich? You tell me. Don't fortune hunters have ways of knowing? She threw me a look like she was throwing a punch, those stunning sea eyes glinting at me. It felt like a blow to the stomach, all the air leaving me. Oh, you think I'm a fortune hunter, do you? So you think I'm trading my body for your money? That's what you think. I must be pretty great at it since I've gotten all of nothing from you, and you've used my body every way you or I could conceive of. Well, you have gotten to stay in this nice big house, I pointed out, instantly regretting it by the way it made her hand tremble as it pointed at me. You've never even bought me flowers, Dare, and somehow you think I've been fucking you for a payout? You know what? Fuck you. I'm leaving, and I won't 
be back to this nice big house of yours. I couldn't take it. She was one foot out the door when I grabbed her, literally picked her up and carried her back to the stairs. She didn't fight me so much as go limp, not holding on, not pushing away. It was worse than struggling. I lost it. I set her down on the third step and fell on her, wrenching her legs open, forcing my mouth on hers as I pressed my full body against her. I'm sorry, I told her with a groan. I was. I wished I could take every harsh word back, though I was still furious. It was mostly directed at myself for saying those things, and for feeling all of this for a woman I couldn't begin to read or predict, let alone control. I didn't mean it. I was worried about you. I lost my temper. She didn't respond, but her lips seemed to give against mine, going from lifeless to soft and trembling. Forgive me, I asked. She gave me no reaction at all. Forgive me, I demanded. She didn't speak, but her arms went around my neck, giving her assent to my increasingly urgent touch. I need you, I said fervently. I don't know why, but I need you, do you understand? She moaned into my mouth, stretching her legs wider apart. Her tiny white excuse for a dress was no deterrent at all. It was already up around her hips. She wasn't wearing panties. I had myself out and against her in a flash, hard and shoving into her entrance. She wasn't as wet as I was used to but she wasn't exactly dry either, and I kept pushing, watching my progress, my jaw clenched so hard it hurt. Each inch that disappeared inside of her was excruciating in its slowness and so captivating that it was permanently burning itself into my brain, even as it happened, infinitely better than the stuff of fantasies. I was halfway buried when I looked up at her face. Her eyes were shut tight as though in a grimace. She was biting her lip hard. That didn't stop me. She was no longer clutching my shoulders, instead bracing herself back on the stairs with her elbows, her succulent breasts arched up, braless and straining against the neckline of her dress. Her nipples were hard and trembled with her every breath. My hands went from her hips to the small buttons on her dress. They ran from her neckline and stopped right at her waist. I ripped them open down to her pelvis, nearly splitting the dress in half. I bent down, contorting my body to invade her while I sucked one aching tip into my mouth, ramming hard, every inch of me dragging hard against her, even rushed. I pulled out with a growl and thrust back in savagely, then again, and again. Every movement eased slightly more than the last, even at my roughest, her body was accepting me, though how the rest of her felt about it I couldn't have said. She was impossible for me to read with her eyes clenched shut, even if her body was wide open. I rutted in her for long minutes, jarring her against the steps, making loud animal noises, growls and grunts that were somehow less impactful than the soft gasps that would escape from her throat occasionally. My orgasm caught me by surprise. I hadn't been ready for it, and I could tell that she was not even close to coming with me. I bit her nipple as I emptied deep inside of her, jerking and thrusting against her even past my own end. I was a beast today. All of the things that had brought out that part of me too complicated and numerous for me to contemplate just then. I brought my mouth up to hers, sucking her abused lip away from her teeth to force a deep kiss. Her mouth was soft and trembling, but otherwise unresponsive. I pulled back, hoping she would open her eyes. She did not. Wrap your legs around my waist and hold on to my shoulders, I ordered, my voice gruff. I couldn't stand her like this and couldn't tear myself away. She obeyed, her head falling against me, eyes still shut. I carried her up to my bed, not letting her shift even an inch away, my cock at rest still inside of her. I lay on top of her, mouth against her ear, nestling into every part of her while keeping my body tense, holding my own weight and still managing to crush her. 
Did I hurt you? I finally asked, the question tearing itself out of me because I did not want the answer. Her only response was one loud, trembling gasp. I started touching her, and though her body was responsive, it was not enough, not what I was used to from her. She wasn't herself, or not the her that I had known. She had withdrawn from me. I pulled out, moving down her body, determined to get what I needed from her, which was not my own pleasure. Not anymore. I needed hers. I buried my face between her legs, hands stroking her thighs, pushing them wide. They were slick with moisture, hers, mine, and I shuddered in pleasure at the knowledge. I lifted her hips up, dragging a pillow underneath so they tilted up and forward. I dragged every rivulet of my seed back up into her sex. I wanted her to take every bit of it inside and keep it there. I didn't let myself examine just what that meant, but on even the most primitive level I could see that I was marking her as mine. I bent to her clit, sucking at it while my busy fingers shoved deep inside of her. I worked on her, doing all of the things I knew she enjoyed, and though there was some reaction... I couldn't get her far enough gone to lose herself. Desperate now, and hard again from my efforts, I dragged another pillow underneath her, gripped her hips in my hands, and rammed my cock forcefully into her. I drove into her repeatedly, strong, measured thrusts as she silently gasped, my finger relentless on her clit. I pushed down on her hips, arching her back so that every pull in or out was grinding against the rawest part of her. I would not, could not stop until I'd gotten what I needed from her. Finally, mercifully, she came, sobbing with her forced release. Shoving home roughly, I emptied myself deep in her womb, thinking that she would be very sore after this. I hadn't been gentle. Desperation and tenderness did not go hand in hand. I made her kiss me, invading her mouth softly, content to be gentle now that I'd gotten at least that bit of relief from her. For her. She opened for me, every part of her available and soft for me. Except her heart, I thought. That she had closed to me, if it had ever been open. Eventually I worked up the nerve to pull back and look at her. Her eyes were wide and clear on me, which was a marked improvement. Are you still mad at me? I asked her, my voice hoarse and raw even to my own ears. She shook her head, her tongue running over her top lip. I growled and kissed her again, sucking her tongue into my mouth until I drew a stubborn groan from her. I lifted off to look back into her face again. Her eyes were still open and cloudless, though enigmatic as ever. Do you forgive me? I asked. Wondering what all I needed forgiving for. I couldn't have said if those last two rough times taking her had added to my crimes. I forgive you, dare, she said solemnly, not so much as blinking. I let that wash over me, as it was everything I needed to hear. Of course, she was a liar, and that one was a very small lie, so it must have been effortless for her. I let myself fall asleep, still on her and in her, exhausted from the restless night and everything that came after. I should not have been so shocked to wake up and find her gone. Not just her, all trace of her. Even her toothbrush was absent. I knew, just knew right away that it was more than her usual vanishing. She would not be reappearing somewhere as though nothing had changed. I was so certain, in fact, that I went immediately to her slum apartment, seeking out any trace of her, intent on making her face me before she walked out of my life. I was horrified to find that all trace of her had been erased even from that awful room she was renting, which was easy to deduce as I found the place unlocked, keys on the kitchen counter, as though she'd left them there for her landlord, whom I promptly tracked down. He was a grumpy white man in his sixties, missing a leg and sporting a bad attitude. He was forthcoming but unhelpful, as all he could tell me was that she'd moved out mere hours before, with no notice and no forwarding address. 
I was at a loss and I wasn't handling it well. I found myself pounding on the front of the neighboring frat house until some hungover kid answered, shirtless and looking confused. He gave me one brief glance before saying, Hey dude, we don't want to buy anything. He tried to shut the door. I moved my foot inside to stop it. Wait, I said loudly. He just raised a brow and opened the door wide again. What's up? I'm looking for a girl. She was living in the crappy duplex next door. Her name was Iris. His expression perked up at that. That smoking hot blonde? He whistled. She is highly bangable, dude. I closed my eyes and counted to ten. Yes, that one. Have you seen her? He shrugged. Saw her coming home yesterday, looking fuck hot, but she was in too much of a hurry to talk. You should have seen what she was wearing, though, bro. Fuck. I turned around and left, because if I didn't, I was almost positive I was going to deck some stupid frat boy. Chapter 15 I didn't give up there. I kept searching, not sleeping, barely eating, too consumed with finding her again. I did this for days to no avail. Inside of every man lived an asshole, and that asshole had a strong dose of I don't give a damn. I honestly believed that. I'd written several male characters based on those simple principles. I'd thought it was fairly irrefutable. Even when I'd caught my wife of twenty years with another man in my own home, my outrage had been followed pretty damn quickly by, well, fuck her, I'm better off. While the asshole inside of me was obviously alive and healthy, all of his doses of I don't give a damn had clearly worn off. I didn't care for that. I wanted my emotional numbness back, badly. Instead, in its place, I felt. I missed. I craved. I yearned. But it didn't matter what I felt or how I suffered. She was gone, and she'd left behind nothing to indicate that she ever intended to come back. As though I'd dreamed her up, Iris had vanished from my life. Book Two Iris Chapter One Dare Two Months After the Falling Out I had a bit of a nervous breakdown after Iris left without a trace. It was the strangest thing, but I suddenly didn't like my own company so much. In fact, I began to hate it, even at home. I still went to the gym at the exact same time, every single day, in the small hope that she'd show again. She didn't, but I kept going because I wanted to see her again. She hadn't been in my life for long, but I missed her. Being that I couldn't stand my own company, I began to reconnect with old friends, people I hadn't talked to since the divorce, the friends I'd chalked up to losses in the breakup, Tammy's assets when we'd been chopping up our combined life in half. For some reason, they all seemed very happy to hear from me. I felt like a jerk for going into full hermit mode and attempted to have something of a social life again. I'd often meet up with another writer friend for coffee or lunch after my workout, telling myself that if I just kept working at it, being a normal person with normal social habits, it wouldn't feel so forced. And it was true. Two months post-Iris and I was looking forward to having coffee with my friend Benji. He was already sitting at a table as I entered the cafe, a few shops down from my gym. I waved at him, saw he had an extra coffee for me, and bypassed the line to go directly to him. He slid me the cup as I sat down. You make your deadline? I asked him. Like me, he was a neurotic, work-obsessed writer, and so we always had something to talk about. It was good. Distractions were good, the more the better. The more plates spinning, the better these days. He nodded with a grin, pushing his thick glasses up high on his nose and sweeping his light brown hair away from his face. He was a good seven years my junior, with a lean, nerdy look that I thought suited him. He wore it well. How about you? I know you were early on your publisher's deadline, but how is your indie project coming along? Good. Good. My word count is flowing faster than ever. I should be done in about four weeks. 
he whistled. Will you settle it to the publisher if they decide they like it and make you a good offer? I shrugged. I doubt it. This whole project is an experiment for me. It won't be much fun if I don't get to at least see how making 70% compares to making, you know, 8. He shook his head, smiling wryly. You're forgetting your advance. You can't tell me they don't give you plenty up front. I shrugged again. Like I said, this one is an experiment. I doubt even my publisher can sway me, and it's not exactly written in the genre I'm known for, so they wouldn't write me a big check for it anyway. You're probably right, he sighed. I envy you the flexibility to do what you want. Some of us are still writing just to pay the bills. We sipped coffee and talked shop for a bit. We were just getting ready to leave when he suddenly trailed off mid-sentence, looking at something behind me. I turned to see what it was, and an electric fire went off in my brain at the sight that met my eyes. Setting my jaw hard, I turned carefully away. So the back of that blonde woman in line resembled Iris, so what? This wasn't the first time my brain had tricked me into thinking she was somewhere close. But it was never her. I'd see some young blonde thing out of the corner of my eye and turn to stare until I met a stranger's blank stare. Not today. Today I was going to ignore the urge to obsess. It wasn't her, just some young woman with a great body. She wasn't even dressed correctly, wearing a pleated skirt and a belted, collared blouse. Iris wouldn't be caught dead in business attire. Holy fucking shit, man, did you see that chick? Benji asked, his tone reverent. My mouth quirked up in a rueful smile. Even the most civilized men turned into mouth breathers if a hot enough woman walked into the room. I did. I took a long sip of coffee, watching Benji, who just kept watching the woman in line, forcing myself, with great effort, to stifle the urge to turn around again. Nice ass, I noted. Yes, but you need to turn around and check out the rest of her huge titties, man. I rolled my eyes. There was a bit of a generation gap between us. My generation thought shit like that, but then we kept it to ourselves, like grown-ups. Big soft tits, he continued, and a semi-sheer white blouse. Fuck, she's got a tan. How many articles do you think I need to write to bang a chick that out of my league? A lot, I mused, still staying firmly with my back to the woman in question. Like, how many is a lot? What do you make? Like, 500 an article? I'd say about 2,000 of those, minimum. If she's as hot as she looked from the back, though, you'd need to be well into the millionaire club before she'd give you the time of day, so... More like 5,000 articles, realistically. His eyes were wide as he finally looked away from the hot chick and back to me. Really? That is fucking depressing, dude. I shrugged. Yeah. The really sad part is you'd have to spend a good chunk of that cash on her if you wanted her to stay around for any length of time. 